video on. Okay, that's on. That's on. Okay. Okay, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, please, if you will. We will start this morning. Okay, what have we been studying? We have, we have been studying... The title I gave it was Fleeing the Spirit of This Age. Fleeing the Spirit of This Age. Um, this goes under the heading of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where we were studying the ministration of the Spirit. Uh, this is showing the, just the vital, vital necessity of experiencing the ministration of the Spirit daily so that you don't get caught up in the spirit of this age. And I have given you several illustrations of friends, friends of mine, preacher friends of mine that have gotten caught up in the spirit of this age. So it can happen to you if it can happen to my preacher friends. Amen. And we came over to Ephesians 4, we're in verse number 17 is what we started looking at. And, and I wanted to show you from Scripture how that you, how biblically God shows us that we can be caught up in the spirit of this age. Alright, what does the spirit, you don't have to turn there, I'm just going to read this to you quickly. What did we see about the spirit of this age in Jude? Well, let me just read this to you quickly. For there are certain men crept in unawares. Crept into where? Into the assembly. Into the church of Jesus Christ. Crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men. Now what were they doing? What was their goal? Turning the grace of God into what? Lasciviousness. And the lasciviousness, we said, basically, is filthy living. Uh, absolutely mo no moral restraint, no moral boundaries whatsoever. Free to think what you want to think and to do what you want to do. And these men creep into the church of Jesus Christ. What I've been trying to teach you, one of the ways to flee the spirit of this age is to be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the witness of the Spirit so that you can identify, so you can recognize who these people are in the church so that you don't become unequally yoked with these people in an effort, you're, you're trying to be kind, you want to befriend them, you, you want to be a priest of God, you want to help them grow in the Lord, that's great, befriend them. But once the Holy Spirit shows you and throws up that red flag that they have no interest in what you're saying. That is not their purpose and goal in this life even though they claim to be saved. And you can tell they are not interested in talking about one thing spiritually. They are not interested in the Spirit of the Lord. They're not interested in what you have to say about the Word of God. You need to strongly assess that uh, if, the, if you're starting to get close to them and, and, and graciously and, and kindly start moving away from those people because they're going to have the wrong impact on your life. Amen. This could be a plant of Satan to draw you away. And folks, that, it doesn't take much. In fact, look with me. Look, look with me back at Ephesians 4. Let's see what it does take. In, in Ephesians 4, verse number 17, remember we said this is, the, this is a picture of the unworthy walk of the believer. And, and it's downhill all the way as, you, as we went. We're not going to go through all that, but as we go from verse to verse, verse 17 down to verse 18, down, and it's all stair steps downward into the fulfillment of total depravity. Well, my brother, that's talking about lost people. No, yeah, it is talking about lost people. But what did he say in verse 17? Speaking to believers. 
Did he not warn you not to walk in the vanity of your minds as other Gentiles walk? Yep, Gentiles are the lost. But he's talking to the believers not to follow that same downward spiral. Why would God put that there if you couldn't do it? We can do it, can't we? And what did he say? Walk not in the what? The vanity of your mind. <coughs> I gave you a definition of vanity. If vanity in this context means moral depravity or empty of any influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Any influence of the Holy Spirit of God. Now, if you remember correctly, you don't, you don't have to turn there. I'll read this to you. He talked about these, these men that crept in unawares. God called them mockers. So they play the game... They'll stand there and sing the same songs as you, the praises, and they might even, you know, act a little bit like, like, like they mean it. They don't. If, if, if there are these men that are crept in unawares, it's part of their guise. They, what, they crept in unawares. They don't want you to be aware of who they are and what their, their goal is. Satan doesn't want you to be aware of it. But it says over here in verse 18, the mockers. How, how, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time. Now listen, who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Verse 19, now listen carefully. Verse 19, these be they who separate themselves. Sensual, he says. But here's what I want you to see. Having not the Spirit. No influence of the Holy Spirit in their life at all, and they don't want any influence of the Holy Spirit. Like the Hebrew Christians in chapter 10, they do despite to the Spirit of grace. They wouldn't, they, they would shut him and shut him down if he did try, and he will try to speak to him. Amen. Because God so loved the world that he gave us. Amen. He, God will try to reach them, but when the Spirit tries to reach them, they will not accept it. When I say that, the majority of things right here will, will not accept it. There might be a, 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 an exception. Amen. I just hope, I hope there's many in these last of the last days in which the Spirit of this age is just sucking people in. And so we find that these people in verse number 19, having not the Spirit, no influence, no impact of the Holy Spirit in their life. Well, in verse 17 in Ephesians 4, he says, walk not as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. What did I say vanity meant? Empty of any influence of the Holy Spirit. Wow, that kind of sounds like the folks in Jude, doesn't it? And you know what, folks? All yeah. you've got to do to be <coughs> of the influence of the Holy Spirit on your life is put off the new man and put off the old man. Stop walking in the Spirit and start walking in the flesh. That's all you've got to do. And so he says, walk not in the vanity of your mind. And then he said this in, in verse 18. We're just going to look at this real quickly. Having the understanding darkened. That means spiritually the lights are turned off. And that's the next downward step to this unworthy walk of the believer. And I told you this, understanding in this sense right here, in this context, <coughs> exercise or enlightenment of one's mental and spiritual faculties. It's basically a ceasing to walk in the light. And that's what happens when we put off the new man. That's what happens when we choose to fulfill our lust. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Mm. Walk in the flesh, and you'll have no influence of the Holy Spirit, and the lights are turned off. It does. That about makes a hair stand up on my arms. Just think about that. No, 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 I can't have that. Never, never, not again. Amen. I'm fleeing the Spirit of this age. Now we found out in Jude there's two ways to do that. Verse 3. <laughs> verse 3, I don't want to tell you incorrectly. Verse 3, yeah. Verse 3, number 1, was contend for the faith. And then in verse 20, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's the way to flee the spirit of this age. I say the next thing we saw there in Ephesians 4, in verse number 18, is, is that being alienated from the life of God 
Well, of course, when you, when you brought the old man, I mean the new man, that's what you, you are immediately alienated from the life of God. When you're no longer walking in the spirit, you're walking in carnality and, and the old man, which is at odds with God, is at enmity with God, it says in Romans chapter 8. And you have, you have no, you're not influenced at all. You have no interest in the life of God. And so, and, but here's what was interesting. Being alienated from the life of God through the what? Through the ignorance that, and by the way, this is willful ignorance. God talks about that in the scripture. And, and if you'll study the word ignorance and the definition of it, it is produced, I thought this was interesting, it is produced by ignoring truth. Mm. It is produced by ignoring the ministration of the Holy Spirit seeking to minister truth. You block it every time. Whether it's a, a, just a, a neighbor or the, something you turn on the radio and it's shut up, shut that radio off. If it's anything about God, you turn it off. I mean, you block it entirely because you are so alienated from God. And I won't go through all of these. And he goes on. The next step is blindness, which remember we said that's callousness, uh, hardness of heart. I thought it was interesting. One of the definitions that was there said stupidity. It's, it's spiritual stupidity. It, it's spiritual assassination. It's spiritual suicide. If you come right down to it. Is what, and then he says the next step, past feeling. Compl I mean, you can't even be touched anymore. You have no sensitivity at all. You are beyond sensitivity to truth and to the Spirit of God. Now, here's what I wanted you to see. That's why we came over here. What will naturally occur now based on your choices is that you too will become lascivious. Isn't that what it says right there? Where is that? That's in verse 19. He says, uh, who being past feeling, have what? Have given. They, that's, what else can they give themselves to? They, they, they've gone back to the old man and to total depravity. It's just <clears throat> natural that you're going to give yourself over to lasciviousness, which is filthy living. No moral standards. You don't place any value on morality whatsoever anymore like you did at one time because you're totally blind. You, you, you're just as hard as a rock. And so a believer can wind up in the same state. What was it these men that crept in unawares? What was their goal in the church? To, to, to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Did you know I can do that? <laughs> if I take Ephesians 4.17 and start down that downward spiral... <laughs> the same thing. I can turn the grace of God into lascivious living. By what? By choices. Yeah. It's my choice. Where are you this morning? Where are you this morning? I hope and pray you're walking consistently <laughs> in God's Spirit. And but I want you to notice the mind of the Holy Spirit now. He says in verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. You, you, you did not learn any of this from Jesus Christ. And, and then he says this, If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And then he goes on to tell you that you need to put off your former conversation, put off the old man, and then he says, Be renewed in what? In the spirit of your mind. And put on the new man, which is created in righteousness and true holiness. Where do you want to live? In, that, in those verses, where you, where are you? Let me ask you this. Not where do you want to live. Where have you chosen this past week to live? Are you somewhere on that downward spiral, that downward staircase? Or, or are you, can you honestly say, well, Brother Paget, most of the week, the majority of the week, I definitely was in the new creature. I, I put off the old man. I put, oh, there was a time or two. Well, obviously. <laughs> we can all testify that there was a time or two. Maybe we can multiply that times two or whatever. But anyway, there, there were some times this past week where we did put off the new man temporarily and we did put on the old man. Okay. What would you do about it? You went to the blood gate, didn't you? And, and, you, and he, he washed it away, didn't he, with the blood of Jesus Christ. And what happened? 
that your great high priest, he, he, he cleansed that defiled conscience, didn't he? And you had the peace of God and the joy of God back. And I hope that's where you are this morning. Amen. And uh, I hope you are absolutely have made up your mind. You are going to flee the spirit of this age. I, I can't even begin to tell you. Yeah, you know what? God can tell us. Look with me. In a, just quickly look over. To, we're already here. Look at verse uh, chapter 6 of Ephesians. Where he's talking about a very similar subject as he is in Jude. He's also talking about how to be strong in the Lord and not to succumb to the flesh. And in very, very common passage, uh, Ephesians 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong, strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. How are you going to flee the spirit of this age unless you obey that verse right there? Amen. And then he goes on and tells you to put on the armor of God. Mm -hmm. And he goes on and he goes on down. And you know what? He even mentions in this list praying in the Spirit. <laughs> Building up yourselves in your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. That's the way Jude said it, right? And so to be strong in the Lord and to be able to contend for the faith and build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Be strong in the Lord. Put on the armor of God. And part of that armor is praying in the Holy Ghost. All right? Now, so, the crux of the matter is that the spirit of this age finds a fruitful breeding ground in the old man. And so what are we going to do to flee the spirit of this age? Don't walk in the old man. Don't put on the old man as much as possible. Amen? Keep your mind set that you're going to walk with God and walk in His Spirit. Okay, let's see here. God, what else am I got here? Don't let me back over in Jude, I think. You know, I, I have told you in the past that one of the surest evidences, uh, a telltale sign, if you will, that you are not walking in the Spirit, but you are walking in the flesh. I like having those markers yeah. and, and that are obvious so that when it happens, it's so easy for the Holy Spirit to say, whoa! And one of those I've told you about are pity parties. Remember, we've talked about that before. Yeah. Oh, if you're throwing a pity party, God ain't there. Okay. He doesn't come to pity parties. And I think I'm going to help you see that a little bit. Um, but anyway, um, I just want to talk to you about our hope of deliverance from the spirit of this age. And I'm going to give you maybe three or four or five things, as the Lord allows me to, uh, that will help you to be delivered from the spirit of this age. What is our, is there hope, Brother Badger? Of course there's hope, amen. As long as Jesus Christ is alive and we, and we have the word of God, which let me, let me emphasize again, folks, when I say the word of God, I always am talking about the King James Bible, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm, I don't like what I'm hearing among some independents. Uh, and, and I don't like the way they're saying it. Because it makes me doubt whether they really believe. Oh, they, oh, they go through the in era, this, yada, yada, yada. And, and you can count on the Bible that's in your hand. And I'm thinking, why don't you tell us? Because not everybody sitting in this church has a KJV in their hand. Right. I mean, if you look around enough, even in our church, you'll see some versions that... No, don't tell them that, folks. What are you scared to say, KJV? I think some preachers are. I, I don't mean to be mean. I love them, but they're missing a little boldness or something. It's almost like it's being critical, or, or maybe no, no, folks. Tell people where the Bible is. It is in that book. And if you have a problem with that, listen to me carefully. I'm not trying to be mean. If, you, if, so, if something in you comes up and flares up just because I said that, you're probably an enemy of the King James Bible. And you may not even mean to be, but be careful, be careful. And if you've got a problem with it, you better figure out which one you think is the Word of God. You've got at least 300 choices. 
<laughs> Maybe more now. But you better be careful of you trying to figure out which one is the Word of God. I, and you won't do it without the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will always take you right back to that book that he used to do all the major revivals, all the major, he had a reason he used it to do the wonderful work of the Holy Spirit throughout the ages. And it was that King James Bible. Folks, that's the Word of God. Stick with it. And stick with it with the right attitude. You don't have to bust somebody over. Right. You don't always have to ride it like a hobby horse, folks. But there's times when you need to mention kindly and graciously what you're talking about when you're talking about. And I'm hearing too many preachers just talk about how we got it and, and yet and never say anything about it being the King James Bible. I'm sorry, and they probably believe it. But it makes me wonder whether they believe it or not. If you believe it, why don't you just say it in a sweet, gracious way? Let the sheep out there know what you're talking about. And some of them don't have that life. So anyway, anyway. All right, so our hope is delivered from the spirit of this age. Number one is obvious. Jude 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. So the first thing I see is do not walk after your own lust. Yeah. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? That's a tough one. <laughs> it's not as simple. How, it's, it's, it's harder than that, isn't it? But the principle is very simple. Do not walk after your own lust. Now, I'm going to give you a, another sure evidence. One of them is what? Pity parts. I'm going to give you another sure evidence this morning. That you are walking after your own lust, and it it's going it's going to be a bit painful. But I'm I'm saying it with love, and I'm saying it with graciousness. And believe me, when I point to you, there's there's one pointing back at me. You 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 see what I mean? But he says here, these are what murmurers, complainers, folks. God hates. Murmuring. And God hates complaining. <coughs> Especially as a young Christian. But even today, I just got through reading the Old Testament again. Or I'm in the process of reading it. And I'm always astonished at the severe judgment of God over somebody complaining or murmuring. <coughs> God hates murmuring folks and he hates complaining I, this was so fascinating when I studied this and it opened my eyes this morning in a way it's never been opened I dig in and study you know for definitions of what, what's that mean and I, I was studying out that word complaining and the root idea of the word that was chosen from the English language I thought this was so interesting it means to strike out or to strike at. I pondered that and thought of that. See, that shows the spirit when, when we're complaining. Where we are striking out. It may be at the circumstance, maybe at the situation many times. But be careful because. This is not something the Holy Spirit is doing through you. And if it's a fleshly act, it's very likely you're striking out at God. Your dissatisfaction, your lack of contentment, your anger at whoever or the situation may be striking out at God himself. And I, and I got to thinking, well, maybe that's one reason God hated it so much in the Old Testament. Because I really believe that in the Jews' life, most of the time, their complaining and murmuring was striking out at their Creator, at Almighty God. And so it means to strike out. Now, just give you a simple definition of, of the word complain so you can help identify it in your own life. Com complain means to utter expressions of grief. And you know, when I, when I read that this morning, I thought, you know, I think I use a term in my life, and I, I think I've been convicted about it before, and I've thought about it many, many times. I've talked to my wife about it. I've got a bad habit of saying, good grief. <laughs> and 
And over the last couple of years, I, I, I really have been dealing with that. And, and I've been trying to, and I've talked to the Lord about it many times. And I've, I've kind of come to the, and I'm trying, I really am trying to get that completely out of my vocabulary. I don't say it near as much. Folks, anytime you've done something you're dealing with like that, don't expect to get rid of, rid of it overnight. We're all growing in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And just fit it into your mind and your heart and say, okay, I'm, I'm, that's something I'm going to pray about. That's something I'm going to work on. Talk to the Lord about it. Be honest. Be transparent. Now, God, I don't use it here as much as I used to. But I used it just now. and I, I don't feel right about that. I just feel like something... I don't feel like I cussed you or anything, but I, I, there's something. And Lord, if that's the case, I probably don't need to be saying it. Would you help me? Give me grace to help rid myself of that. To utter expressions of grief, of pain, of dissatisfaction. That's a big one. Lack of contentment. Dissatisfied with your portion, with your lot in life. At this time. Ooh. Be careful. Be careful. Because you might be walking in the flesh. Amen? And I might be walking in the flesh. All right, another definition I saw was this. To lament or express sorrow and regret for your present state. Mm. To, la to lament or express sorrow and, reg for, and regret for your present state. And that can go so far as to be like Job and just regret you were born a woman. I mean, that can go pretty deep, can't it? But folks, it's a very unhealthy, it's a very destructive state of mind to be in. Because your lack of satisfaction and your lack of commit, com, contentment is probably a fruit or an indication of your spiritual condition where you are. Uh, you probably aren't, you, you're just disregarding some scriptures, um, like being thankful in all things and, 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 and looking at things. You, you just like James chapter 1. You're ignoring James chapter 1. I mean, those circumstances, those people that are irritating the stew out of you, uh, you you're not counting at all joy <coughs> when you fall into these sufferings and adversity and diverse. To, see, it probably comes back on us and our spiritual situation. And, and uh, so be careful with all of that. Uh, it, it means to express annoyance. Oh, that one hurt when I read it. I can deal with that one. Especially when I'm on the highway. <laughs> oh, but folks, I will tell you, I've told you that many times. That's one of my great weaknesses. It is jerks. I mean, people. <laughs> and, uh, but I want to tell you, I got a good report. It's such a blessing. And I, I am loving it. You would not believe the victory God has given me in recent months on the highway. It, it's, I, I tell the Lord when I start out, Lord, this is their world, not mine. It, make it as though they're not even in my world. I want to be observant. I want to see what they're doing. I had one come up on me this morning. I said, God, don't let that enter into my world. That's not part of my world. I don't need that in my mind. I don't need to think about it. Just is it help me as though I don't even see it. And you wouldn't believe how God is answering prayer. I mean, I'm excited about if Jesus tarries. I'm excited about six months from now. I'm excited about the point where rarely ever, rarely ever does anybody on the highway even move me or even alarm me. I think you can get there. I believe we can get there if, if we will let God work in our life and, and produce that in us, that response in us, the right Holy Spirit comes. Amen? Amen. And our life is full of different categories like that, isn't it? Well, don't worry about it. You're maturing. You're growing. As long as you have confessed your sin, and you know this morning you have you are right with the Lord, you, your sins are confessed, you are maturing. Hello, that's the ministration of the Holy Spirit we study. I mean, he's, he doesn't slumber or sleep. He's constantly working in you to mature you. And I'll tell you one more time. Don't just, one of your worst enemies in mind is beating yourself down. Yes. That's, that's one you can work yes. on right now, big time. Amen.
You you work on that and get and, I, and I'll have to say, Lord, if you're listening to what we're saying here. God has just given me tremendous victory in that area. And it's through, you know what? It's been through what I've been teaching y'all. Because it's been all over me. It's, it's been all over convicting me. And, and the, the Word of God sanctifies. Amen. Purifies. And I love it. Bring it on, Lord. Bring it on. And it's, I love seeing my own spiritual growth because of what He's teaching me to teach you. Isn't that great? I love it. I love it. All right. To express annoyance and resentment, to find fault with. Oh. Folks, I'm a perfectionist, okay? I, I'm sorry to admit it. Uh, I, I'm, I am, that's something I've had to battle all my Christian life. And um, a bad thing about being a perfectionist is you find fault with everything. You find fault with everybody. And you got to be so careful because the first thing you know with the working of the flesh... That'll just become characteristic of you when you talk. When people think of you, they'll, they might even shun you because they know every time they talk with, to you, you're finding fault with something. The government. Uh, pastor. People in the church. Uh, the economy. Gasoline. I don't care what it is. You're constantly talking about the negative and finding fault with everything. Oh, so see, there's one of my battles right there. To find fault with, to find fault with how life or others are treating you. <coughs> Capital I O U. How they're treating me. <laughs> you see how that can become so self, 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 self. Just things we need to work on. Don't, don't you dare think about beating yourself down. Amen. I'm not giving it to you for that reason. This is things that we need to to, to work on. It, it, it really, honestly, it's, it's raw, 100% gray flesh. That's what it is. It is it's us. It's, it's fulfilling our desires and what we want. We're supposed to be dead to that, right? Mm -hmm. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in a big capital us. Amen. Totally opposite, isn't it? Than, than this walking and that flesh that we're talking about fulfilling our lust. All right, and then of course, uh, uh, this one is an obvious. I saw it as one of the last ones I saw. To grumble. Nothing suits you. And of course, nothing is ever right. Anyway, so that's the first one. Do not walk after your own lust. Number two, let's look at verse number 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. Now listen carefully. And their mouth speaketh great swelling words. I, you look that up, study the words there. It means prideful. It means arrogant. It means self-centered, self-exalting, self-conceited. <laughs> so my... Second point here, do not walk after your own lust. And then the second one, very simple. Walk in humility. Total opposite of that right there. Walk in humility. And there again, folks, I'm just so glad humility is a work of the Spirit in me. And I, I'm so glad that when I go to the blood, I wouldn't be confessing my sin, Brother Elmer, if, if there wasn't humility in me that got the Holy Spirit produced <coughs> if there wasn't conviction and grief and sorrow over what my offense against God if, if, the, if I didn't have any humility I would not be there humbly on my knees and bowing my heart and my mind earnestly desiring for my sins to be washed up that's just an evidence of humility amen and you ought to praise God all the time I mean, humility is my greatest virtue. <laughs> Whoops, I, just, I, think, I think I just blew it. You know I'm teasing about that. But walk in humility. Jesus said in, in, the, uh, in what was it, Philippians 2.8 uh, that he humbled himself. Now listen, he, he's, Jesus yes. humbled himself? Jesus humbled himself and became obedient 
unto death. And that's, all, that's what he asked of us, is to humble ourselves and become obedient unto death. But with us, it's more of death of this right here. Right, Brother Robert? I don't mean the tongue inside. That's included too. But this right here, our flesh, amen? True humility will lead. Obedience in God's order. Contriteness is first, which produces humility. And what always follows humility, now, you know, always, what always follows humility is grace. God giveth grace to the humble. But always, what always follows humility is obedience. And why did God give you the grace following humility? Because you can't be obedient without the grace of God. And what always follows obedience? Personal righteousness. What we call practical righteousness. And the biggest part of that obedience, brother, are your judgment calls. Your decisions, you're going to make at every crossroad. That's the biggest part of that obedience. It is when you get there using biblical principles that you've learned, and you apply that biblical principle to every decision during the course of the day. And if you apply that principle, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, it's a right decision, and it produces righteousness in your life. And of course, what follows righteousness? Holiness. You see God's order? Folks, God is a God of order. Amen. So, walk in humility. Um, number three. Let's see, where's that? That's in verse, no, yeah, that's in verse 16 too. He says here, uh, speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in ad admiration because of advantage. Now, we're not going to go into this like we did the last time that we studied this. We talked about the, the, in, the, the infatuation that this age and the citizens of this age have with men. I mean, they, they love to make gods out of men. They look, everything's got to be a hero. They've got to be exalted beyond the superheroes. And it's in every area of life. Folks, so I'm not going to go into that again. What I'm simply going to say is that... Um, that was a battle. <laughs> <laughs> and let me just say this. Give supreme admiration. Now I'm going to play on these words. Give supreme admiration to the Lord Jesus Christ because of advantage. Remember, he was talking about giving admiration to men because of advantage. <clears throat> In other words, the world attaches themselves to men and wears their shoes, wears their clothes written all over them and, and because of advantage. It's, they honestly, in their poor, self deceited mindset, think that makes them somebody better. And, and some, because they wear, because they, they got this. Eddie Hoot Hoot edition of their Ford truck or whatever, you know, their, his name is on it. And it's, folks, that's vanity. Walk not in the vanity of your minds. That's the admiration of men because of advantage. It, 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 it prospers you. You think it doesn't. Amen. That's deception. It's part of the deception of this age. And so, uh, give supreme admiration to the person of Jesus Christ because of advantage. Now I'll close with this. I gave you a definition, if you remember correctly, of the word advantage when we were talking about the worship of men. I'm going to give you the same definition because it's the same. And this is what it came, this is the biblical definition that I've studied. It basically means beneficial. That which benefits you. Uh, getting supreme admi admiration to the person of Jesus Christ will always benefit you. Amen. Another part of that definition, and I like this, to promote one's cause. See, in the world, when they admire and exalt and make gods out of men, and, and, and they're promoting their cause with that name. They think they are. It, it, it's a bunch of hooey, a bunch of deception. But folks, when you give supreme admiration to the person of Jesus Christ because of advantage, you are promoting not your cause, and I'm going to say this carefully, 
you're promoting the cause of Lord Jesus Christ. But, now wait a minute, I'm going to back up. You are promoting your spiritual cause. When, when you give supreme admiration to the Lord Jesus Christ, you're promoting your, spirit, your spiritual cause because the, the goal of your life becomes the same goal of the ministration of the Holy Spirit in 2 Corinthians 3. And is that you worship and you adore and you magnify that person to such a degree that your whole life is about being conformed to his image. Father, in Jesus' precious name, Oh, fleeting time goes so fast. Thank you, Father Lord, for the spirit of the living God. I can trust you to seal these truths to the hearts of these precious people. Go with us. Bless us. Father, we're excited about the next service, the kids, the teenagers, the pastor, the adult audience, and all this going on. Brother Chris, the choir, magnify yourself. Lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. May the word of God be magnified just beyond limits. We love you. We need you. Do a work of grace and the lives of the saved and the unsaved. Bring repentance if it's needed in both. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen folks. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. You know what's wrong with the grace of the bride? I'm just going to let you know my heart is clean. I'm sorry. Because it's not what I felt and what it seems. What it seems to me to be. What's wrong with the bride? I think that's pretty good. Right? Oh, I would have been here. Happy birthday. Yeah, that's true. Smite you on the heart. I have to recognize that it's been your heart, bro. I hope that that's a good time for the family. Oh, my gosh. She's going to be here. I'm going to miss you. Yeah, but I'm glad for the occasion. Thank you very much. Great lesson today. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Thank you. Oh, my God. She is a saint. We have a lady that's going to be here. Yeah.